Hebrews chapter 2. Our study tonight is the first four verses. It's the first warning in the Bible. And let me say to you at the very beginning tonight that this is a very emotional study for me because as I go through this first warning, I have pictures of people in my mind. Over the nearly 24 years that we've been here, I've watched people drift away from their first love. I've watched people who started out so well and had so much promise only to drift away because they lost focus. And so if I get emotional tonight, it's because those faces are running through my mind and my heart. Would you read along with me, please? We must, underline must, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? The salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Father, we need your help tonight. The most insidious thing about this evil of drifting away is that it is so subtle, so imperceptible that many of us are doing it or at least beginning the stages of drifting from that first love and we're not even aware of it. It's as quiet as an enemy saying, you don't have to go to church or, oh, today it won't be a big deal if you don't read your Bible. Maybe it's in our home and our focus is lost because we're concerned or worried about so many other things. Maybe for some here tonight, the world is beginning to creep in just a little bit. Lord, would you challenge us tonight? Would you speak to our hearts and change our direction? Oh, God, don't help us drift. Instead, help us to stay focused on the work that you've given us to do. I do pray, Father, that if there's even one here tonight who isn't born again, that they would hear how much you love them pray that they would give their hearts to you, that they could receive the forgiveness of sins and a great and passionate new life in Christ. Additionally, I want to pray for those in here who are yours, but who are hurting, whether it's physically or spiritually, emotionally. We know the enemy will use everything he can to get us to begin this process of drifting away. So Jesus, arrest us tonight. We thank you for the sweet time of worship. Now, Lord, may we worship you in spirit and in truth for your glory. Amen. In 1985, I opened a car dealership that we really didn't know what to expect. It was in a brand new part of town in Phoenix, Arizona, Um, There were some big dealerships already that sold the brands of cars. We had Nissan and Pontiac and GMC truck. I remember training people while the building was being built for months. And the day before we were going to open, I called a meeting of all of the staff. Everybody you can imagine was excited that finally we're going to start making some money. We're going to finally start serving customers. And I brought into the meeting a file with the big letters on it, complaint file. And I told all of the workers there, I said, tomorrow is your first day. This is our complaint file. And there isn't a single name in this file. And I told them that from this point forward, every name in that file 
is our fault. I also told them that they needed to understand that as the man responsible for opening and then running that dealership, that if any complaint ever got to me, I was automatically going to take the side of the customer. Now, they didn't like that much because customers aren't always right in spite of what we hear. But my point was we need to keep this complaint file empty. We need to do our job and we need to do it well. We need to do it with a smile on our face. We actually need to treat our customers as though they mattered to us. Well, it worked great. Within a year, we were the largest Pontiac and GMC dealer in the nation. We were the fourth largest Nissan dealership in the nation. And in all three of the divisions, we were number one in customer satisfaction. And it's because we kept focused on the mission. I was thinking about that today as I went over just before church to get ready at the gym. I was in the shower. Our gym here in the parking lot, is just a few months old. It's brand new. They spent more than $3 million on the building. We walked in there the very first time, and it was clean, and it was pristine. And today, I was in the shower getting ready, and I couldn't help but to notice how filthy everything was. And all I could think about was, it wasn't like this just a few months ago. How could it be that so quickly they've lost their way? Well, the answer is they lost focus on the mission. It's a restaurant that Paul and I go to that I love. We've been going to this restaurant for 16 years since they opened. And we're noticing Attention to detail is drifting away. The consistency of quality is beginning to wane just a little bit. And it's all because, for whatever the reason, they're losing focus on the mission. Well, for Christians, losing focus is far more serious than a car dealership or a gym or a restaurant. But make no Mistake, when we lose focus on our mission, we're going to find ourselves slowly drifting away. And as I mentioned in my prayer, drifting away, the first of the six warnings in the book of Hebrews is from my perspective the most insidious because we're not even aware that it's happening. (coughs) Tonight, if you're drifting away, be honest. The end of our study tonight, as always, we'll have people up here. You can come and ask them to pray for you. can sort of relight the flame. (coughs) If you don't drift away, you see, you won't fall into the trap of the other five warnings in this book. And each of those warnings gets worse by degree. And the consequences are significant. As we begin tonight, let the Lord speak to you. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. Now, I don't like the construction of the NIV here, because the word therefore ought to go at the beginning of the sentence. Remember, there's no chapter and verse divisions that are inspired by God in the original manuscripts. And that means that therefore begins or should begin this sentence. It's the same thing as saying, because Jesus is God's final word. That was our very first study in the book of Hebrews. Because Jesus is superior to angels. That was our last study in chapter 1. Because he's God's final word, and because he's sufficient for the readers of this letter during any of their times of trouble, therefore... Our writer's about to drive home a critical, but what I also want you to understand is a practical point. So let me begin tonight with a word about biblical warnings. I believe the Bible is written purposely 
by the Holy Spirit in such a way as to make Christians, any of us who are not walking in the Spirit of God, to feel a little insecure about our salvation. Now, I'll clear this up for you a little bit later, but the Bible is written in such a way that if you're not walking with Jesus, Jesus, abide in me and I'll abide in you. If you're not doing that, you're always going to have doubts. You're always going to have the enemy shouting at you. You're always going to be wondering what you could do better or how much more you could do. And that's good for us because reading the word keeps us on track, keeps us focused on the mission. And every Christian who is abiding in Christ has no doubts, no insecurity at all about their salvation. I want you to settle for once and for all tonight that Jesus loves you, that he saved you, and that he's got you in his hands. Now the very purpose of a warning in Scripture is to drive by force Christians to examine their standing in Christ and cause them to abide in Christ at a deeper level. When people are not abiding in Christ, we gen- generously call these Christians backsliders. You know I hate the word. I don't even think the word exists in heaven. So as we study these warnings, beginning here, let me make two critical points that you can't forget as we go through the rest of our study tonight. The first is that real Christians cannot lose their salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14 says that We were given an inheritance, the Holy Spirit, as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance in heaven. Now, if I guarantee your inheritance in heaven, the guarantee is pretty sketchy because I don't have the resources to guarantee anything. But if it's Almighty God who's guaranteeing your inheritance, we can take that to the bank. The second point that I want you to understand is that only God truly knows whether or not somebody is saved. We say, well, I answered an altar call, I was saved. But God knows if it was a genuine conversion. And we see Christians all the time seemingly walking away from their salvation or seemingly deciding that they don't want Jesus anymore. Only God himself knows if they were saved or not. In the book of Galatians, we're told that God cannot be mocked. Nobody is going to fool God. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, speaking of professing religious people, said, away from me, I never knew you. Lord, Lord, why do you call me Lord? You don't do what I tell you to do. You see, the issue in heaven has never been, do we know him? The issue in heaven has always been, are we known by him? Please understand these things as we go through this and the other warnings in the book of Hebrews. Now, I personally believe there are two warnings in this first sentence, but they're kind of lumped in one warning. This first warning is this one, we must pay more careful attention. The word must, of course, is an obligation. It has nothing to do with whether or not we gain salvation. But for those of us who are saved, remember Hebrews is written to believers. If we're really saved, we must pay more careful attention. It's a choice that we should make based on the arguments the writer of Hebrews has already made. God gives us choices in life. He tells us we should pay attention, even that we must pay attention if we want the fullness of his blessings in our life. If we want to keep our passion, if we want to stay on track, we have to be men and women who pay attention. And still he leaves the ultimate decision about doing so to you and to me. God will never force his will on any of us. Now paying attention here in this first verse is in the present active tense. It's literally to continue to pay attention continually and always. And it means to give, the word is a powerful one, super abundant care to the things that we have heard and will hear tonight. So I'm going to be real practical. Here's the biggest problem for most of us. We listen repeatedly to the things of God. You can't come to this church 
without the Bible being opened and without the Bible being taught. It doesn't matter what day, who the teacher is. It's what we do. It's who we are. And if we're really paying attention to what God is saying to us, we will actually do what he tells us to do. We'll come to church expecting for our lives to change, expecting that God is going to speak to our heart, that he's going to answer some questions. And as a result, we're going to change our course or alter our course based on what we hear. Again, one of our problems is that we spend far more time outside of church on things that have nothing to do with God, things that interest us, things that we call hobbies. We spend much more time on our cell phones and on social media platforms. Then we do the word of God. That indicates we're not really paying attention at all. And if we don't do what God tells us to do, well, then the lack of attention that we're paying is going to cause some real difficult times. The proof that all of us are paying attention is that we do what we hear. And still, week after week, people sit in church. They nod their heads, even acknowledge what God is saying to their heart. But then they go home and they change nothing at all. When that's true, always when that's true, because it's not paying attention, we really begin to drift. So the argument is Jesus is really God if he's God's final word. If he really is superior to angels, shouldn't we then do what he says to do? Now, in every warning, I'm going to remind you of this as we get through all six of them in this book. These are Jewish converts to Christianity that are being addressed. They have, for a long period of time, been facing difficult trials, even the confiscation of their property. They're getting tired, and things are getting more and more difficult. And there's an easy escape route from their difficulty. All they have to do is go back to their Jewish family and say, I'm leaving Christianity, I'm returning to Judaism. But you see, that radical step doesn't start all at once. It began a long time ago when they began drifting away. This letter, directed to these believers, is God sending a life preserver through the pen of the Apostle Paul. Here's why we should pay attention, super abundant attention, so that we do not drift away. You ever wonder sometimes in a moment of reflection how I started out so well and ended up where I am now? Have you ever thought about how you came to church at the beginning and all you could do was sit in the front row? Just had to soak up everything. You didn't want to miss a Bible study. And pretty soon you, you started thinking, well, you know, if I miss sometimes, it's no big deal. And figuratively, so all of you in the back row, this isn't directed at you. <laughs> but metaphorically, figuratively, we go from the front row and we start moving back a few rows over a period of time. Pretty soon we're sitting out in the foyer listening to it over the loudspeaker. <laughs> we don't want to be bothered. We find ourselves... Men especially, please pay attention to this. We find ourselves coming just a little late to church so we can miss the singing. When at one time we'd raise our hands and we'd sing praises to the Lord and consider it an honor and privilege to do so. Paul would write to the churches in Galatia. You foolish Galatians. I'm going to paraphrase. What's happened to you? You started well. What began in the spirit are you now going to finish in the flesh, he wrote. If that describes what's happening in your heart and in your mind, pay attention to this warning against drifting. Many, many years ago, I was about 15 years of age, me and some friends, we were out in Newport Beach and we were surfing some storm weather. It was really, really big and it was... It was dangerous, and yet, you know, we had to go out and do it. I'm 15. Nothing could happen to me. And I remember just kind of sitting there, and, and riptides were all around us. And finally, it was time to get out of the water, and I got out of the water. 
and I had drifted in riptides a mile and a half away from where I began. I thought, how did that happen? I started by the pier, and now I'm way down at 18th Street, and how did that happen? Well, it happened so slowly, so imperceptibly, that I wasn't even aware. Sitting on a board, everything is fine, and yet I'm really drifting away from that point. I lost focus of that lifeguard station so that I could always stay in the place where I started out. Well, this is the same picture that the writer of Hebrews is trying to communicate to us. Drifting from Jesus is, in my view, one of the biggest problems in the church today. As I said earlier, so subtle as to be unrecognizable. It begins by missing prayer time in the morning or Bible study at home. There's less of an urgency to get to church and hear what God has to say. Instead of being regulars, we sort of drift away. Now remember, I'm preaching to the choir. You're here on a Friday night. It's the other people that are drifting away. <laughs> you know that your drifting has begun when you find yourself giving advice to people instead of biblical counsel, instead of giving them God's word. It's evident in our homes when fathers stop teaching Bible to their children and to their wives in the home. I once taught a high school group of Christians about evangelism, and I began by asking them, and these are kids who grew up with saved parents and were in church all the time, and I asked them, who knows what the gospel is? Who can explain it to me in a sentence or two? And not one of those high school age kids could do that. That will never happen at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio. Those families had already been drifting away. I want you to notice that when we drift away from something, the movement, the motion is ours. Jesus is our rock. He's immovable. He doesn't go anywhere. He stays put. He never changes. And yet we're the ones who move. Maybe we get tired of the stress in our life. Maybe we get tired of fighting the battle. Maybe we're a little frustrated because God's not answering our prayers. Maybe things just get hard. Or perhaps somebody has treated you unkindly at church. And we begin the slow drifting process. Jesus is always in that same place saying, come back, come back to me, return to your first love. Jesus has promised never to leave us and never forsake us. So when we drift, though unintentional and certainly not willful, it is a slow, gradual decline. But never forget, we're the ones who have moved. It's never Jesus. We begin with good intentions. We get tired of the daily struggles. And soon we find ourselves in a place we never dreamed we'd be. Drifting Christians usually keep up appearances. Most of us have no idea that they're drifting, let alone that we're drifting. We can be seated next to somebody in church and we wouldn't know they're drifting because they've still got the Christian language down and they still look the part. They still say all of the right things. But remember, God can't be fooled. God knows who's drifting away. And he's going to speak to you clearly about it tonight. Drifting Christians, you see, go to church. They read their Bibles. But they do so without passion. They do so as sort of a mechanical exercise instead of as a time of devotion. Instead of opening the word of God and, and saying, okay, Lord, speak to me. What about me and what about now? They open the word as though, well, I've got to get through it because I've got to read my chapter in the Bible today. Drifting away always involves this type of a loss of passion. Often it's a loss of passion through familiarity. 
We take for granted all the things that we know and have heard. We stop reminiscing, rehearsing in our own minds all of the things that God has done for us. We forget how good he's been and we start focusing maybe on the things that we don't have. That's certainly what's happening here to these Jewish Christians. Often we lose passion through pride. When you talk to somebody who's drifting away about something that they're not doing, you say, well, the Bible says, oh, I already know what the Bible says. And then we wonder why they don't do then what they say they know. Some of us lose passion, as I indicated earlier, by drowning in the business of everyday life. Maybe it's the hobbies I talked about or our commitment to social media. I'm telling you right now that this church in the United States of America, and let me be even more personal, this church at Calvary Chapel, San Antonio, if every one of you spent more time in your Bible than you do on your cell phones, we couldn't contain the power that God would manifest through this body of believers. Sometimes it's just the whole hum of everyday life. We can sort of put it on a spiritual cruise control And we do so without thinking. We all have a million things to do. This is a very busy world that we live in. Busier than God wants it to be for most of us. And unless we're on guard against drifting away, that's exactly where we're going to find ourselves. Because if something in our life is going to be sacrificed, it's not going to be our cell phone time. It's not going to be our Facebook time. It can't be our work time because we've got to pay bills. So what gets put off, it's always Jesus. And it's always Jesus because we know he's not going to smack us around or fire us if we do. So Jesus becomes sort of an afterthought. Guys, please hear this. Satan loves it when Christians lose their passion, when they lose focus. We remember that the first century church in Ephesus lost their passion. Jesus writes to him and says, you have forsaken, you've left your first love. Do you think the church at Ephesus was aware of that? Do you think they even noticed it? If you read the description in Ephesians chapter 2, this was a church that looked like the happening church. In our culture, it would equate to they had a big building and a great youth program and they were doing all kinds of good things in the community. And Jesus says, yeah, you're doing all those things and you test those who claim to be apostles but are not. You're watching out for false teachers. But none of that matters to me, Jesus, because you've lost your first love. And the church at Ephesus, I would love to imagine what it was like when that letter was read to them in about 95 A.D., I want you to think about the math. 95, Jesus was crucified in 32 AD. So in that very short period of time, as a new generation of believers grows up in Ephesus, all they were was a church going through the motions and they weren't aware of it. Drifting Christians remain some 2,000 years later the largest group in any church. And they are the reason for the weakness, the lack of power in the church today. It's because we simply don't care. We love him. We know we're saved. But when we begin that process of drifting away, really bad things happen. Now, I've said this to you a thousand times over the years, and I don't think that's hyperbole. I'm your pastor. I love being your pastor. But the truth of the matter is if I get any distance between me and Jesus, I'm going to blow it. My flesh is no better today than it was the day before I got saved. But you see, as I stay connected to Jesus, as you stay connected to Jesus, our flesh dies in the process and drifting away doesn't happen. It's when our flesh takes over that we begin the process of drifting away. It's often the reason we'll see later in the warnings why we drift into sin. 
Nobody wakes up one morning and says, you know, I've had it with this holiness junk. Today I'm going to sin, I'm going to have some fun. Today I'm going to go and do this, I'm going to go do... We don't do that. It's a slow, gradual process, this drifting away. And that's what makes it so (coughs) dangerous. The question that you can answer, the question you have to answer just between you and the Lord is, what about your passion for the Lord? Are you as in love with Jesus, as crazy about him as you were when you first got saved? If Jesus is not the most important person in your life, the most important thing in your life, your relationship with him, then you're already drifting away. (coughs) I want, personally, for all of us to be like limping Jacob in Genesis chapter 32 when he says, I will not let go until you bless me. That's the only way we can prevent ourselves from drifting away. If we're on guard, if we'll pay careful attention (coughs) to the things that we've heard so that we do not drift away, we'll always be with him where he is. Here's the rationale. Verse 2. For the message spoken by angels was binding. Now this is a reference that all Jews would understand to the law of Moses, which was revealed through the angels. Deuteronomy chapter 33, Acts chapter 7, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. For the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. The the emphasis here is that when we are disciplined by the Lord, we deserve it. It's the just or the right thing to do. Then he adds this in verse 3, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? If the law given by angels demanded punishment, how much more should we regard the words of life that come through the Son of God who is greater than angels? If we ignore that greater word than Moses, Is there any hope for a fruitful Christian life? I want you to notice that the action taken to those or by those in danger of drifting away is to ignore. Again, it's not willful. You have a King James that says neglected. And the Greek word means to make light of or to treat carelessly. If you look at your Bible and say, well, that's not a big deal. You know, people say to me, all the time. Well, you know, where else does it say in the Bible that I can't do this? Well, how many times do you need God to say something? That's treating it lightly. That's dealing with the Word of God carelessly. Why would we ignore what we know is true? Our ignoring it doesn't make it any less true. It just means that we have disregarded what is true. And that is a sign of a drifting Christian. You know where else this Greek word for ignore is used? It's in Matthew chapter 22, verse 5, when Jesus was speaking of those who disregarded his invitation to the wedding banquet of the Lord. The invitation was extended, but nobody RSVP'd. And in the parable, he says, just go out to the highways and the byways and get everybody else. Just invite anybody and everybody. And so many ignored the invitation. The writer's point here is that there are grave consequences for not practicing what we hear from God. We who are New Testament believers, we are far more accountable than the Old Testament believers they heard the word of the God through the word of God through prophets. We heard from God Himself. Chapter one said, "In the person of God the Son, they had the promise of Jesus. We in the New Testament have the fulfillment of that promise." And so He says, "This salvation, literal translation of that is rescue mission. This rescue mission, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard Him." God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. 
Now, verses 3 and 4 tell us three things about our salvation that we really need to think about so that we can pay attention, so that we won't drift away. The first, it was announced. Our salvation was announced. I don't know when you heard it. I don't remember the very first time I heard it. I remember people telling me, you need Jesus. That's not an announcement. That's a finger pointing time. It was announced. Announced by Christ himself. It was announced with volume that the world will never be able to drown out when that tomb that they laid a dead man in was empty. And the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? The announcement was so loud, so profound, that if we ignore it, we're in danger of drifting away. The second thing is that it was confirmed. You see, the salvation that we cling to is no fairy tale or fantasy. This isn't something that we Christians make up to make us feel better when people we love die. Or when we get a bad report from a doctor and we think, well, at least I'm going to go to him. This isn't just keeping our fingers crossed and hoping. It was confirmed by that same empty tomb. It was also confirmed by real historical men who saw Jesus, men who touched him. Listen to this, 1 John chapter 1, the first three verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We've seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the life or the life eternal, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. One of the things that John does in all three of his short epistles is that he keeps repeating himself over and over and over, saying the same thing. How many times is he confirming that this isn't something that was made up in the imagination of man? So our salvation was announced, then it was confirmed, and finally, there was a testimony to it. It was testified by God himself with signs and wonders. All one has to do is read the book of Acts. All one has to do is walk with Jesus, abiding in him, and see the signs and wonders that will occur in our lives. God's apostles, we know, traveled throughout the earth doing things that only God could empower them to do. And the signs and wonders were always signs pointing to Jesus. Simon the sorcerer, sell me this power so that I can do this thing and lay hands on people and they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Counterfeits began springing up almost from the very beginning. And yet everybody walked away. I always think of Simon the sorcerer, the man that was thought by Samaritans to be the great power of God, God himself. A magician, he had everybody tricked. And when he saw the real thing, he knew, he knew that he was a phony. And this was the real thing. It was testified. And then again, we have the most important testimony of all, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ that every unbeliever is going to answer for. If we remember these things, then we won't drift away. Now, as I close tonight, I want to close with application because that's what makes this warning so valuable to all of us. This warning addresses our hearts. It addresses our attitudes. I asked you earlier about your passion for Jesus. Have you lost it? As excited about getting up and talking to him as you were when you first believed. You know, I have matured in the Lord in 28 years. At least I hope I have. Paula tells me I have. 
But the truth is, I'm as passionate for him as ever, perhaps even more so, because my love is deeper. It's not a puppy love. It's not like the first real crush I had on a girl in junior high school, and I wrote her name on everything. My love for Jesus today is based on a relationship. My love for Jesus is based on all of the things that he's done for me and through me. My love for Jesus is based on all of you. Because I get to see God's work in your lives on nearly a daily basis. Have you lost your passion? That kind of love. Do you feel like an outsider when week after week I talk about loving Jesus more than you love your next breath? Loving Jesus more than your spouse? Loving Jesus more than your children? What does that stir in your heart emotionally? Is it one of those things, oh, come on, how can you love Jesus? When I talk about falling more in love with Jesus, how do you respond emotionally to that? Sometimes we men think, oh, you know, that's silliness. I am more in love with him than I ever was. And the more I'm with him, the, the, the more I'm connected to him, the more like him I become, the more of his love I receive. And of course, because he loved me first, I can love him. And that love never dies. How do you feel? I hope not left out when I speak of personal intimacy with the Lord. Somebody were to say to you, what's Jesus doing in your life right now? Would you have an answer beside the old Christianese? You see, if it's not true, then you're in danger of drifting away. In fact, if the answer to any of those questions is yes, you're in danger of drifting away or you've drifted already. So please, tonight, take inventory. Are you excited about the Bible? Now, I don't mean excited like you're watching a good movie and it has you on the edge of your seat. But are you excited to get up and say, Lord, what do you have to say for me? You know, these days with cell phones, uh, I I don't get texts. I don't text. Most of you know I, I can't see. And so it's frustrating to me because people don't answer phones anymore. <laughs> and I always leave voicemails. In fact, I won't return a phone call if the voicemail is not left. Um, but, but it's frustrating because I leave a voicemail and they don't listen to them. And yet God never puts me to voicemail. God never is tired of what I say to him. God never screens my calls. He always will speak. Are you excited about God speaking to you in his word? If you'll read your Bible, I promise you, You'll get excited by it. What about prayer time? And I can make everybody instantly feel guilty by asking, so are you a good prayer? Do you pray enough? The answer is no, nobody prays enough. Paul said pray without ceasing. How do we do that? It's not being in a closet going, oh God, and sweating and wanting miracles. It's just being with Jesus, just talking to him every single day. If you'll do that, it will revolutionize your walk. Your heart will be filled overflowing all over again. It will be better and richer than your first love with Jesus. What about Christian fellowship? I always worry when Christians spend more time with unbelieving friends than they do with other Christians. I can't go to church all the time. Sunday's my only day of rest. And Well, wait a minute. Christian fellowship. The church needs you. You need the church. What's your attitude towards serving? Jesus washed 
feet of his disciples, including the betrayer. Most likely the way they were seated around the table, the first set of filthy feet Jesus washed would have been Judas's. How do you feel when you're serving others? If you lose sight of who you are, if you lose focus on being a servant, then you're going to drift away. If you've ever heard somebody say, well, you know I was serving, but, but nobody was grateful, nobody even thanked me for it. You've already drifted. If you're serving and you're doing it to get other people's attention, you've already drifted. We're servants of the Most High God. It's a privilege and an honor to do so. When you understand that, when you live that, it's impossible to drift away. Do you hunger for righteousness, for holiness, personally? If not, you're drifting. And you're going to be in a dangerous place. If not, tonight, Come forward for prayer and ask God to forgive you and create a new and a pure heart in you because I promise you he will do that. I'll close with this reminder. This warning was written to a real church, real humans with real problems. People just like you and just like me. And our author is crying out to them. He's going to say, but I have better hopes for you, hopes of salvation, hopes of fruitfulness, hopes of abundance. That's hard to hear and hard to believe if in fact you're drifting away. The solution is clear from the first verse in our chapter tonight. Pay more careful attention and make sure you're not drifting. Keep your Focus on that compass point so you always know how to get home. Are you a drifter? I pray not. But if you are, Jesus is that compass point. Return to him tonight. Would you pray with me? Could we men and women from the pastor's class come up?